Welcome back, everybody, to another week of Sunday School here at the Lighthouse Church of the Nazarene in Moravia, Iowa, where we're going through the book of Job. This week, we're in Job chapter 41. So that means that we only have two chapters left today and next week, and then we're going to be done with the book of Job. So quick review of what we've been going through the whole book of Job. Job was a righteous man. He was the greatest in all of the East. Satan appears before God and says, well, that Job, he only serves you because of how much you bless him. Take all those blessings away and he will curse you to, to your face. That's what Satan accused Job of. God said, okay, I'll take that deal. So in one day, Job lost all his earthly possessions, plus his 10 children, his seven sons and three daughters. How did Job react to that? He said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And it says, in all this, Job did not sin. So then Satan again appears before God and says, oh, all those things, they're just things. Take away his health and then he will curse you to your face. So what happened? Job's health, he got infected with boils. I mean, he was just in severe pain. And in fact, his wife said, you know what? Just, just curse God and be done with this. Just curse God and die. Now, we need to give Mrs. Job a little bit of credit because think what Mrs. Job went through also. Mrs. Job also lost all of her 10 children. So Mrs. Job's probably like, let's just end this together. Let's just be done. So, but then what does Job tell his wife? Job says, well, shall we accept good from God and not evil? And it says, in all this, Job did not sin. So then Job had three friends show up, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, and they just sat with Job for seven days and said nothing. And then finally, after seven days, Job opened his mouth and said, why did all this happen to me? I, I've, I've tried to be a good person. You know, bad things aren't supposed to happen to good people. And then his three friends tried to give him an answer. And then for the entire book of Job up to chapter 32, it's just Job and his three friends talking back and forth. Then in chapter 32 to chapter 37, we have a young man named Elihu who starts speaking. And then in chapter 38, that's when God shows up. And what does God do? He says, who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. And then uh, in chapters 38, 39, 40, and 41, Job, God asked Job, 77 questions. Now, some people say there are 70 questions. Some people say 77. Some people say 80. I think I even read an 84, but God asked Job a lot of questions. We'll just say that. And you know what? Job doesn't ever answer even one of God's questions. So, like I said, this week we we're in chapter 41. Last week we were in chapter 40, and we looked at a creature called the behemoth. Now, what was the behemoth? It was some enormous creature with an enormous tail. That's what we can say about him. Um, most commentators will say that it was a hippopotamus or a rhino or an elephant, but none of those have a big tail. And in chapter 40, it says he moves his tail like a cedar. So last week we looked at the behemoth. This week in chapter 41, we're going to look at another creature, something called Leviathan, the Leviathan. Now, there's a difference between the behemoth and the leviathan is this. The behemoth, it seems to be a land creature. Um, the leviathan, it's, it's an amphibious, but it's mainly a sea creature. So let's just start reading here. We're in Job chapter 41, verse 1. Let's get out our Bibles and let's follow along. Job chapter 41, verse 1. This is God talking to Job. Can you draw out leviathan with a hook? So leviathan. What is it? Well, let's look at a couple different verses because the word Leviathan shows up in the Bible about four times. So if we go to Isaiah 27, verse 1, Isaiah 27, verse 1, this is where God says this. In that day, the Lord with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Leviathan, that twisted serpent. Now, this is interesting in the book of Isaiah. Because the word Leviathan, it, its root Hebrew word means twisted thing. So a Leviathan, it's a twisted serpent. Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. So um, this is actually a picture of some prideful kings in Isaiah chapter 27. But it gives us a little bit of this picture of what Leviathan is. He's a reptile in the sea, and he's a, he's a twisted serpent. We know that. Um, let's go to the book of Psalms. 
Psalm 74, verse 14. This is where we see Leviathan again in the Bible. Psalm 74, 14. This is where God says, You broke the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gave him as food to the people inhabiting the wilderness. I have no insight in the, on that verse right there. I just used it because the word Leviathan is in there. But let's go to another one. This is Psalm 104, 26. Psalm 104, 26. Psalm 104, 26. All right, I'll start in verse 25. This great and wide sea, in which are new innumerable teeming things, living things, both small and great. Talking about the Mediterranean Sea, this great big sea. There the ships sail about, and there is that Leviathan, which you have made to play there. So it's interesting. Leviathan seems to inhabit the great seas, you know, where the great ships are. That's the plaything of Leviathan. And we have seen this Leviathan back in, it's been in the book of Job already. Job chapter 3, verse 8, if you want to look up that for some. All right, but the, we're in Job chapter 41. Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook? It seems to mean some sort of twisted sea creature serpent. Now, we have to ask ourselves, is this a description of a real creature that we are about to read about in this chapter? Or is it something mythological made up? Is it a description of a creature that still exists this day and we just don't know about it? Or is it extinct? Or is it just some metaphor to symbolize something like a, a whirlpool or is just a way to speak symbolically of Satan? These are the questions we have to ask ourselves. So Job 41 verse 1, God is asking Job, can you draw out Leviathan with a hook? Well, these are rhetorical questions. So, so the answer must mean no, whatever this thing is. It's too strong for hooks. Like, you know, we probably don't have a high enough test line, a fishing line to do it. And then listen to this. Or snare his tongue with a line which you lower. Now, a lot of people say Leviathan. If you're reading um, in your study Bible, probably a lot of them will say it's either a crocodile. Most will say it's a crocodile. A whale, a shark, or even I read one that said that Leviathan was a whirlpool. But here's the thing here. Do you know crocodiles don't have tongues? And it says right here, can you snare his tongue with the line with you, which you lower? Look it up for yourself. Crocodiles don't have tongues. So I don't think we can say it's a crocodile. Um, also, would a crocodile be referred to as a twisting thing? I, I don't know about that. Let's keep going here. Verse 2, can you put a reed through his nose or can you pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many supplications to you? Will he speak softly to you? I think he's what God's saying is, you know, can you make a pet out of this thing, Job? Verse 4, will he make a covenant with you? Will you take him as a servant forever? Verse 5, will you play with him as with a bird? Or will you leash him for your maidens? Verse 6, will your companions make a banquet of him? Will they apportion him among the merchants? I think what this is saying here is that nobody is hunting this thing for sports or for food. Um, do you remember the Flintstones? I believe wasn't their main meal brontosaurus burgers when they would go out to eat on the Flintstones? Right here, whatever this thing is, this great big serpent, nobody eats it for food. Let's keep going here. Verse 7. Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? One thing we can definitely say about Leviathan, just from our readings so far, is that it seems to be it's definitely a creature of the sea because he's talking about, can, can you get it with hooks? Can you spear it with spears? Can you pierce his skin with harpoons? I think we can definitely say that the Leviathan is some sort of sea creature here. But let's keep going. This is God talking to Job. Go ahead, Job. Lay your hand on him. Remember the battle. Never do it again. What he's saying here is, you know what, Job? If you do lay your hand on it, it will be the last thing you ever do. Now, I want to injecture this right now. Some people do um, associate Leviathan with Satan. And, and if we think about this, how else is Satan referred to in the Bible? I, I believe there's like 27 different references, different words to reference Satan. But Satan in the Bible, he is referred to as the serpent and as the dragon. So I can see why people make that uh, association. But I think what we're reading here is way more than symbolic language in, in my understanding here. I think we agree with this. Verse 10, no one is so fierce that he would dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand against me? So first off, if this thing's a crocodile, nobody's been so afraid of crocodiles that they're just, oh, we got to stay away from this thing. No, they're like, oh, let's, let's stay back, you know, within 10 feet so this thing can't get us. 
But the main point of this whole thing, this whole passage, is this right here. Verse 10 is the main point of God's speech, in which he says, No one is so fierce that he would dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand against me? We, what God's saying is, is that we, as men, should have more fear of God than we should of this Leviathan. Uh, what did Jesus say? It's in Matthew 10, 28, where he says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And uh, what's Proverbs 9, 10 say? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If we as men cannot contend with this creature, the Leviathan, how could we ever stand before a God who is able to control this thing and subdue it and who made it? I think that's the main point of this here. You know, if we're so afraid of Leviathan, we should even have more fear of God. Let's keep going here. Verse 11, another great one. I actually have this one underlined in my Bible. Who has preceded me, this is God talking, that I should pay him. Everything under heaven is mine. That, that's the passage that I have underlined in my Bible. Everything under heaven is mine. And the Bible talks about this in many other ways. It's Psalm 50 verse 10. Where God says, for every beast of the field is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills, they are all mine. Um, the Psalm of David, it's Psalm 24, 1, which David says, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. You know, I think it's in the book of Haggai, isn't it, where God says the silver and the gold, they're mine when he's talking about the temple. The main point, what I'm trying to say is everything belongs to God. All right, we're 11 minutes in. I haven't even really talked about anything interesting yet. Verse 12. I will not conceal his limbs. The New Living Translation here, um, it says, I believe it says something like, I want to emphasize his limbs. Crocodiles don't have huge limbs. They have short little stubby legs. So I don't think we can say that this thing is a crocodile. I will not conceal his limbs, his mighty power, or his grateful proportions. Verse 13, who can remove his outer coat? Who can approach him with a double bridle? Verse 14, who can open the doors of his face? with his terrible teeth all around. Right here is why some people say that Leviathan is a crocodile, just because he has these terrible teeth all around. Um, my thought is that this is a sea creature that probably has teeth like a crocodile. Don't crocodiles, don't they have like 60 or 66 teeth? I don't know why I think that. Let's keep going here. Verse 15, with his rows, his rows of scales are his pride, shut up tightly as with a seal this is why we can say the leviathan is not a whale whales don't have scales whales are mammals whales are mammals correct all right let's keep going here verse 16 one is so near another that no air can come between them verse 17 they are joined one to another they stick together and cannot be parted now this is where it gets really interesting right here verse 18 his sneezings flash forth like light and his eyes are like the eyelids of morning first off in verse um, 18 here his sneezings flash forth like light if you're reading an old king james version right now the word it's going to use is it's actually going to say it's sneezings which is a breathe blowing air out of your nose um they didn't have any word to translate this back in the 1600s they didn't have the word to translate this from hebrew hebrew and greek so what did they say they actually made up a word, and the word is sneezings right here. So, verse 18, his sneezings flash forth like light, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. This is another interesting thing right here, the eyelids of morning. Do you know in Egyptian hieroglyphics that the eyes of the crocodile are the symbol for morning? Now, we might say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would the eyes of the crocodile be the symbols for morning? For like morning, like morning sky, you know, good morning, not morning like you're morning a dead person, but good morning. So we might ask ourselves, well, in Egyptian hieroglyphics, why would the eyes of a crocodile be the symbol for the new morning? It's because the eyes on the crocodile are the first things to appear. You know, before the entire body comes up from the sea, you see the eyes. So this creature right here probably has eyes like a crocodile, based just based on this verse 18 right here. Verse 19, this is where it gets good. Out of his mouth go burning lights. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke goes out of his nostrils as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. Excuse me. His breath kindles coals and a flame goes out of his mouth. Was Leviathan a fire-breathing dragon? Did, did we just read about a fire-breathing dragon in the Bible? What do you think? 
Well, let's let's talk about this first. First, dragons are mentioned many times in the Bible. The word dragon is mentioned 35 times in the Bible, 22 times in the Old Testament, and uh, 13 times in the New Testament. Now, yes, sometimes that's referring to Satan, but we see the word dragons in the Bible quite a bit of the time. So first off, let's talk about dragons. Were dragons real? Well, there's actually a lot of evidence that dragons were real. Marco Polo. Have you ever heard of Marco Polo? He was a great explorer in the 13th century, or in the middle 1200s. He actually traveled to the Far East in China. He spent 17 years over there. And he actually traveled the Silk Road back and forth, plus sailed to China. But Marco Polo, in his uh, writings on his travels, he actually reported of royal chariots in China being pulled by dragons. This is in the writings of Marco Polo. And in fact, clear up to the 1600s, we have um, historical evidence in writing that the Chinese empire actually appointed the position of royal dragon feeder to somebody. That there was, a, there was an actual position of royal dragon feeder. So, we're asking the questions. Were dragons real? Here's another interesting one. The Chinese calendar. The Chinese calendar, it's actually based off of 12-year cycles. And each year has an animal given to it. And here's the animals. I have them wrote down right here. The Chinese calendar is based off these 12 animals. A rat, an ox, a tiger, a rabbit, a snake, a horse, a goat, a monkey, a rooster, a dog, a pig. And guess what the last one is? The dragon. Now, we would have to ask ourselves, why would we have all these... Um, if dragons aren't real or were never real, why would we have all these other animals? Rat, ox, tiger, rabbit, snake, horse, goat, monkey, rooster, dog, pig, and then throw this mythological dragon in with the rest of them. The evidence seems to be that there were actually dragons historically. Um, another one, you'll have to look this one up for yourself. The town of Nurlock, France was actually renamed after somebody killed a dragon in that town and it became a new name. And there's actually um, historical secular books, not religious, secular books that actually um, talk about dragons clear up into the 1500s. So there is evidence that there were really dragons and uh, it would seem to match up with the Bible, would it not? But let's talk about this. Okay, even if there were dragons, were there actually fire-breathing dragons? Now, this is just getting out of hand, isn't it? Fire-breathing dragons? Well, let's look at something. In nature, we actually have something called the bombardier beetle. The bombardier beetle, guess what its uh, self-defense mechanism is? It actually shoots fire out of itself. It has a chemical, it, it actually secretes two chemicals, hydrogen peroxide, one of them. I don't know what the other one is, but the bombardier beetle, its self-defense mechanism, he's pretty much a fire-breathing beetle. He can excrete liquids that is a two, at 212 degrees and he can shoot them at high pressure a long ways away. So they're basically a fire-breathing beetle, and that's their self-defense mechanism. Here's something else that we in the Midwest see every summer all the time. Guess what I'm going to talk about? Lightning bugs. Lightning bugs. How do lightning bugs light up? It's a chemical reaction within the lightning bug to produce those lights. So would it be possible for there to be a fire-breathing dragon? Actually, yes, there would be. Um, another thing. Some dinosaurs, they have strange compartments in their heads that scientists don't have any clue what the, what these compartments in their head that are linked to their nostrils, they have no clue what they are. Also this, there's hundreds of legends all across tons of civilizations that all talk about fire-breathing dragons. Now, if fire-breathing dragons had never been real, why would there be all these legends across all these civilizations that had never talked to each other? One other reason I think fire-breathing dragons were probably real, not just because we're reading about them in the book of Job, but if you go clear back to Numbers chapter 21, verse 6, I'm going to turn back there real quick. Numbers 21, verse 6. Numbers 21, verse 6. This is where um, the people are complaining and uh, Moses has to put the bronze serpent on the pole and everybody looks to it. But listen to this. I'm going to start in verse 4. Numbers 21, verse 4. Then they journeyed from Mount Or by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God, against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the people are complaining. So guess what God does? And I'm reading out of the New King James Version. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Could the Bible have been talking about fire-breathing serpents right there in the book of Numbers? Sure could have been. Um, another thing, talking about dragons, many of the old-time Bible commentators, they, they all talked as if dragons were real. 
John Gill, he was in the early 1700s. John Calvin, early 1500s. John Trapp, early 1600s. Even Charles Spurgeon, he was in the 1800s. They all talked, excuse me, as if dragons were real. All right, let's keep going here. I'm running out of time. Verse 22. This is talking about the Leviathan. Strength dwells in his neck, and sorrow dances before him. The folds of his flesh are joined together. They are firm on him and cannot be moved. His heart is hard as a stone, even as hard as the lower millstone. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. This just doesn't sound like a crocodile to me. Listen to this. Because of his crashings, they are beside themselves. The King James Version actually does this perfect. The King James Version actually translates this. They purify themselves. You know, when, when Leviathan raises them up, the mighty men, they purify themselves. What does that mean? It means they need to go change their underwear. Anyway, verse 26. Though the sword reaches him, it cannot avail, nor does spear, dart, or javelin. He regards iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. The sling stones become like stubble to him. Verse 29, darts are regarded as straw. He laughs at the threat of javelins. Pretty much nothing can stop this thing right here. Verse 30, his undersides are like sharp pot shirts. He spreads pointed marks in the mire. This, this here is where we know he's amphibious, at least, because New Living Translation takes us to where he plows up the ground. Verse 32, he leaves a shining wake behind him. One would think the deep had white hair. That's how we know he's also a sea creature. On earth, there's nothing like him which is made without fear. He beholds every high thing. He is king over all the children of pride. What's the main point of all this theory that we just read about Leviathan? Whether he's a crocodile, a fire-breathing serpent, a dragon, what is he? What's the main point? The main point is the power and majesty of God. If we can't contend with Leviathan, why would we contend before God, who is so much more powerful than Leviathan? So, we're done with chapter 41. I thought it was a great chapter. I love studying up for this. One more chapter in the book of Job, chapter 42 next week. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. And I'll see you the same time, same place next week. Bye.